I've always found illegal immigration and what people say about illegal immigration to be the truest test or one of the truest tests of patriotism when it comes to political, you know, ideologies, where you fall in the political spectrum. And when you explain why you feel that way to people, you can tell they question it. And here's what I mean by that. You have a home, apartment. Lord willing, maybe you're in a cardboard box, but I hope you have some place where you dwell. Would you let anybody inside of your home? Of course not. I, I, it's a ridiculous question. It's a rhetorical question. Every, you, you, you go answer the door tonight, ding dong, you're eating dinner, and you show up and there's some guy with teardrop tattoos down the side of his face demanding to come in your home. You're going to close the door, lock it, probably go call the police and maybe grab your in-home firearm in case he ch tries to come in, right? Of course not. Why? But why? Well, the answer is also obvious. You love your home. You value your home. You value the people inside your home, obviously. You value yourself. You value your stuff. You love your home. Therefore, you closely monitor who can and can't enter it. We all do these things now. Who doesn't have a little, a little in-home camera you can buy for 10 bucks at, at, at a department store? You love the things in your home. You have a security system or, or, or maybe just door locks, maybe a weapon. All these things to protect your home because you love it and you should. And you should. How closely do you monitor who watches your kids, who hangs out with your kids, who coaches your kids, who teaches your kids? Pretty closely. Why? Because you love the little rascals. Even my bad kids. I love them to death. I want to know, what are you teaching them? What are you talking about? Who's watching out for you? I want to know these things because I love them. And yet, and yet, so many people, it's a policy position of the Democratic Party, and it's the position of more than half the Republican Party that just let the illegal immigrants in. It's compassionate. Aren't you compassionate? Be compassionate. You should have a heart. No. Well, I love my country. You love your country or you don't love your country. If you love your country like you love your home, which you should because it is your home, then you care very much about who can and can't enter. You see, it's the ultimate test. And it's why I talk all the time about Democrats being the anti-American party now. They weren't always, don't get me wrong. That's not an indictment of longtime Democrats. If you're watching this, and I know we have a bunch of you, and you're one of these older JFK Democrats or even a Bill Clinton Democrat, that, that doesn't really apply to you. But this modern Democratic Party won't even fly the American flag at their convention. They are the anti-American party, and you can tell because of their stance on immigration. They're more than happy to throw open the floodgates and allow anybody in here is it to win elections? Sure. But what it really tells you is this. They don't really care about the place. They wouldn't let a single one of those people. Go, you know what? Go ahead and show all these migrants at the, at the border. A Democrat right now who's pushing for the things Joe Biden's already doing. A Democrat right now would not allow a single one of those people to cross the threshold of their home. Not one. They'd probably be calling the cops if they saw one of those people in their driveway. And yet, they're all totally fine with them coming on into America. And look, it brings up something uncomfortable, but it's true, and you know it's true. You know what I say at the end of every, every opening? This may make you uncomfortable. Well, allow me to say it early. This may make you uncomfortable, but it's true. They don't love the country. You can try to sell me it's because of compassion all day long. I know a lot of compassionate people who don't let just anybody in their home. It's not compassion, because you don't care about the country. And look, one thing we get wrong all the time, not Democrats get it wrong intentionally, but one thing we get wrong all the time is we think about poor people coming here from, and I admit, by the way, if I was down there, I'd probably be trying to come too. I, I'm, not, I'm not actually indicting the people trying to come. I get it. But if you're, if you're fleeing some country, we think of all of it, you know, Mexico, Central America. They're poverty-stricken places, oftentimes violent. These people are going through it. You want to get yourself, your family out of there. But we don't think about the fact 
they watch what we watch. I mean, you get that, right? We lose sight of that as Americans because we're so used to being number one. Other people listen when the American president talks. They, they just do. We don't, because you and I don't do that, we don't think other countries do. I mean, when's the last time you heard uh, Putin's voice? He's even a huge one. You probably don't even remember when you heard Putin's voice. When the American president speaks, the world listens. The world listens. And these people, well, they know where their bread's buttered. What do you want for your people? What I want for my people, I just want patience and peace that we can get to the U.S. because they're having a new president. Where's Biden? He's going to help all of us. He's given us 100 days to get to the U.S. and give us legal mental paper so we can get a better life for our kids and family. They watch the news, too. They're watching. I have had a bunch of buddies on Border Patrol over the years, and they'll tell you they monitor the news, even if they're not heavily political, they monitor the news closely to see what the president is saying at the time, because when you say things like, oh, 100-day moratorium on deportations, oh, of course they can come in. When you say things like that, they immediately turn off the TV, embrace for impact, because they know the second that went out over the, over the airwaves, they're coming, batting down the hatches. That creates a surge at the border when the president speaks in those terms. So, I mean, what, look, you're an illegal immigrant trying to flee a bad situation. Look, maybe you're a bad person, a drug dealer or something like that, but maybe you're trying to flee a bad situation, and you hear Joe Biden do things like this, what are you going to do? These are his executive orders. On day one, he did this. Remember, this wasn't a day seven thing. He knows. He knows what he's doing. Day one, this is what he did. He halted construction of the border wall. He ensured that dreamers would not be deported. Included illegal aliens in the census. Protected liber Liberians from immigration. I will still call them librarians from immigration enforcement and introduced a pathway to citizenship for 11 million illegal aliens. How about that? And by the way, in case you're curious why they would want illegal aliens, why is there, there's always this argument about including illegal aliens in the census. It's because the number of Congress people your state gets depends on the population of the state itself. So they always want to count the illegal aliens, which always gives the Democrats another blue congressional seat. That's why they're so into it. And remember, another thing it shows you they don't care about, I'm not just blaming Democrats, this is half the Republicans are these open border losers too. They don't really care about your money. And, and we get, it gets lost on us sometimes, too. I'll admit, it gets lost on me when you look at government spending on this, of military here, and we're invading this country here. And, of course, we have this social program, and government's doing this to help out this guy and this to help out that guy. Look, even stimulus checks. These things tend to get lost on us, but that's our money. That's the money you work hard for. Don't ever lose sight of that. Don't ever look at your paycheck and see money taken out by the federal government and then just dismiss it. Look at it every once in a while. Not often, because you'll lose your mind, but look at it every once in a while and then go and see what they're spending your money on. What does illegal, illegal immigration cost you? Quote, the taxpayer cost of roughly 11 million to 22 million illegal aliens across the U.S. totals nearly 700 and $50 billion over the course of a lifetime, while each deportation costs just $10,900. This indicates that taxpayers would save about $622 billion over a lifetime if every illegal alien was deported and every illegal alien will not be deported. How do I know? Well, here we have an internal email. This is from Fox News in reference to release them all. It's about an internal ICE memo. Quote, Release them all immediately. That was an email to ICE officers, and it reveals the chaos after, after Biden halted deportations. You see, here's another thing. We don't have the resources. You realize that when it comes to ICE, and this was only a couple years back, I may be off of my numbers now, for all the illegal aliens we have in the country, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, whatever you believe that number to be, 
We have about 6,000 ICE agents. About 3,000 of those are actually enforcement agents. Does that sound like a country that takes illegal immigration seriously? Of course it doesn't. And what we've done is we have this horrible, convoluted legal immigration process and this terribly porous illegal immigration process. What choice are people going to make? Everyone knows what choice they're going to make. This is going to come across the border illegally. We have a gigantic open for business sign on the, on the border of the United States of America. And we're shocked we have a problem. But remember this. This is the most advanced, powerful country in the history of the world. If people are coming into it who aren't supposed to be, it's because the people in charge want them to. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. We got a great illegal immigration special for you tonight. Hang on. Migrant Caravan. I feel like I've seen this movie somewhere before, but I also feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding out there about what migrant caravans are, what they aren't. So, look, by a two-to-one margin, this is according to Rasmussen, by a two-to-one margin, voters want the migrant caravan stopped at the border. There's not some gigantic American clamoring to let them all in. But you may not even know what it is. Maybe I don't either, although I know everything. Joining me now... With the Cartel Chronicles, Breitbart.com, the guy who's forgotten more about immigration, illegal immigration cartels than anybody I've ever known, Brandon Darby. Brandon, why is there a migrant caravan? Who organizes it? How does it start? Where does it start? Give me the goods. Well, so usually what happens is people from all over the world, actually, but but in this case, people from mostly from Central America, um, they end up getting into deals with cartels various cartels usually the gulf cartel or los Zetas, and they make a deal to come to the u.s border and then to get crossed into the united states and then they spend the next however many years making weekly or bi-weekly payments uh, to the cartel wiring money back and so forth so a lot happens to those people who come here um you know depending on whose estimates you listen to, whether it's Doctors Without Borders or Amnesty International, um, you know, anywhere from 33 to percent to, you know, 80 something percent of the migrant females who come are sexually assaulted along the way. Many times migrants come and, and they're left to die or they're killed once they've paid some money and they just decide, hey, I don't feel like taking them across today, I'll just kill them. Um, so a lot of bad things happen. So what happens in Central America is sometimes people who are trying to make a political statement, other times people who who are simply trying to protect the people coming here, they say, hey, if we organize a caravan and put everyone together, then they can get through Mexico more safely to the U.S. border. And, um, you know, like I said, sometimes that's people who have a political agenda. Sometimes that's people who uh, are simply advocates for those people and they want to try to keep them safe. And other times it's a mixture of both of those, right? Um, And you usually can't tell what's going on or who's organizing it until later, and then you start to get into the facts. Uh, But that's really, that's how these things form and what they are. So it's a protection, I mean, well, obviously with some exceptions, it's a protection against cartels abusing people. Now, what was the policy when we had all the, when people remember we had all these migrant caravans coming and then all of a sudden they stopped. What changed? Did Trump do something? Who did what? Well, yes, yeah, so Trump did. So so basically just as a, to start off with, right, um, anytime you have illegal immigration or regular migration, whatever you want to call it, you have to have push factors and you have to have pull factors, right? So push factors are the things in their countries of origin that suck or that are awful, like whether it's jobs or violence or war or whatever. And then the pull factors are things that we do. Like if we have a good economy, that's a pull factor. If we have policies that allow people to stay here, once they get here, that's a pull factor that encourages them to come. So when you have the push and the pull factor, you make it inevitable that people are going to uh, try to make that illicit journey here, right? Um, so in the Trump administration, 
what Trump began to do was a policy called remain in Mexico. So if you if you were coming here to say, I want asylum, they would make you stay in Mexico while they adjudicated your asylum claim rather than just allow you to come into the U.S. and then let you go in the United States. And then maybe you don't show back up. Right. Um, the other thing that they did was they encouraged Mexico and other nations to get more strict at the at their borders and to not allow people in big groups to come through. And all of those things together did lower the numbers. If people if people thought, hey, there's less of a chance I'm going to get to stay in the United States, where they're like, I'm not going to get in debt for five or ten thousand dollars to the Gulf Cartel and not be able to pay him back and, and get someone in my family killed. So people, less people came. But with the Biden administration, um, it's not so much that policy changes have been made that um, are really impacting that, but the discussion and the talk about it, right? So if you listen to what Kamala Harris said during her campaigning, if you listen to what Biden said during his campaigning, uh, there were ideas thrown around like decriminalizing crossing the border, health care for all, including people south from who are not here legally. Um, and those kind of things, people have the idea, and I think rightfully so, that the U.S. is going to be more amenable to allowing them to stay, uh, at least temporarily. Um, then when you, in addition to that, you say, okay, they're looking for a path to citizenship for everybody who was here before January 1st, where they're like, well, if I go to the U.S., it's going to be horrible for a while. I'm going to have to hide for a while, but eventually they're going to legalize me and I'm going to get to stay because that's what our choices are, are telling them. And so those are pull factors, right? So the push factors are already there. The pull factors are drawing more people in. Um, and, you know, right now with the Biden administration, uh, there isn't any evidence that he's asked Mexico to be nicer at their southern border. He probably will. Um, do that, but it's possible he won't. And in that case, it's kind of weird because your options in this situation are really either we're going to have a show of force at our border and we're going to shoot tear gas at people, or we're going to have somebody do it for us and they're going to shoot tear gas at those people for us. And then we're going to act like Trump is bad, but I'm a better president. I didn't tear gas people, but really he's encouraging another country to do it for him, to do his dirty work. So that's kind of where we are. Brandon, I, I, people get confused. Look, I get confused sometimes when we talk about Central America and people fleeing Central America. They, they appear to come out of that. They're, they're coming out of there in droves. Why? What's happening in Central America or which country in Central America? Are they actually at some, you know, some kind of crisis where they're we're dying down there? Well, it, that's where things get tricky. Um, there are places in Central America, and there's a lot of places in Mexico where people are dying. And there's a lot of places in Mexico where the government, the federal government cannot do routine police actions, for instance. They can't send in federal agents or police to go arrest someone. They have to send in an armored convoy uh, of their Marines, their actual mar Marines, right? It's not a colloquialism. It's actually, they are their their marina, their, their elite military forces have to go in and do routine police actions because they're dealing with people who have RPGs, you know, rocket propelled grenades, armored vehicles, and what have you. Um, so there are places in Mexico that's like that. And there's also places in Central America like that. But one thing that is is almost universally common across Central America for the most part, for the vast majority of people, is that you have like a really systemic um you have a systemic poverty. So when I was with the migrant caravan in uh, Tijuana uh, several years ago, and I, I spent some time down there with them and interviewed them and what have you, most of the kids, even though they would have benefited from saying they were five, uh, they were 12 or 10 or 11, 13, and they looked like they were five or six years old. And you say, why is that? How can the kid look so small? And how can the mom be overweight? But then at the same time, when you look, there's no muscle mass. There's no, the bones are very frail. And you're like, how is this possible? Well, that's because they eat a, a diet with like high corn diet, but they don't have nutrients that they need. So you have this systemic issue where these people, their entire lives have had a lack of nutrients and therefore their bodies didn't develop properly. Their brains don't develop properly. And, and so people you know, does it, it, does it suck to live there for most people? Yeah, it sucks really bad. Yeah, they, 
you know, people can still be obese and then still be starving, right? But not having the nutrients that they need. Um, so, so it's definitely not pleasant to live in Central America for most people who do live there. Um, but at the same time, at the heart of that question is, does that entitle someone to asylum in the United States? And that's not the way that the that's not the way that the laws are written. And so the Trump administration said, hey, I understand it's awful to live there, but you you can't just come here because it's awful to live there. And then Democrats are saying, well, it's awful to live there and and uh, there's a lot of violence and it's unsafe, but um, you know, really what they're saying is, is like, hey, these people are, are really malnourished and poor and, and it's violent. And so let's just let them come, even if the rules don't totally make way for that. So there really are legitimate discussions to be had about food and about nourishment and about poverty. I totally understand that, but but it, it really is unpleasant for most people who live there. You know, the, there's a very stratified economy, right? So in the United States, we have a middle class, we have even our poor, you know, are, most of them are doing pretty well. Um, in relative terms to, to the poor and the rest of the world. But in Central America, that's not really the case, you know? Mm, that's tough. Count our blessings. Brandon Darby, Cartel Chronicles, thank you so much, brother. Thank you so much. We'll be back. We forgot about illegal immigration, sadly. I, I, for some reason, after Trump got into office and that whole fake dust up on the border about concentration camps, we just stopped talking about it. But we stopped talking about it because Donald Trump was actually doing something about it. And the people in his administration were actually doing something about it. And here's something I want you to understand before I bring on my next guest and talk about these numbers. If you're someplace in the country that is not in close proximity to the border. It's easy for you to forget about the fact there are people who live on the southern border or close to the southern border who have to use the buddy system to go get the mail because it's so dangerous. Americans, their lives have been taken away by illegal immigrants. This is something that happens in the United States of America. And look, things are already getting worse under the new administration. We have the numbers. These are the arrests of illegal aliens with criminal convictions. And you'll see, according to the chart, uh, the numbers were going down every single year of the Trump presidency until, wait, what's that? What's that? What's that date at the bottom? 2021? It's still January. And 2021 has already eclipsed 2020. That's how bad it is. And to talk about that... And other things is Agnes Gibney. She is an angel mom. Her son was taken away from her by an illegal alien. Agnes, thank you so much for being brave enough to come on the show today, for telling your story, for, for raising awareness. Much appreciated, ma'am. Thank you so much for having me. Would you please, if you wouldn't mind, I know it's not the easiest thing in the world, explain what happened with you. Well, I was born in uh, Budapest, Hungary. My parents fled the country when I was two years old after the Soviet Union invaded uh, our country. Um, we couldn't immigrate to the United States because they wanted us to stay in Yugoslavia where my father was born. So we ended up in Brazil where, where I grew up and uh, immigrated to the US legally, fully vetted uh, at age 16 in 1970. And uh, my only son, my firstborn, Ronald Da Silva, was murdered by a previously deported criminal illegal alien gang member. Now, you may think this is an isolated case. Uh, there are thousands of Americans that have been uh, victimized, hurt, killed, murdered by a previously deported illegal alien. And uh, I emphasize previously deported because it's important to know he was already kicked out of the country for uh, doing criminal activity. He was a gang member, uh, burglarized, uh, you know, all, I had a long history of arrests and he was able to come back into the United States and take my son's life. Oh, man. 
I'm so sorry. All right. How do they get back? Because we hear this all the time, Agnes, of deported, deported three times, deported four times, deported five times. Are we just dropping them just two inches on the other side of the border and turning around and running away? How does this happen? You know, I don't know. I would like to know that myself because uh, I don't know where they cross, if they just cross over at the uh, at the gate, at the border, by the border patrol, sitting in a car with someone else, or just cross two feet over. You know, if you ever been to Tijuana, you see that there's a lot of places there that people can come in without any issues whatsoever. Or other other areas. Uh, we need to secure our borders. And President Trump was right on, on the target with this issue of uh, keeping our country safe. You lock your doors at night. Why do you lock your doors at night? Not to keep those that are in your house in the house, but to keep the criminals from coming in your house. And uh, and they, they say, oh, that's racist. What's racist about it? protecting your own land, protecting your own home, protecting your own family. And I'm not saying by all means that every illegal alien or criminals, there's many, many of them uh, that are very nice uh, law-abiding, well, law-abiding up to that point when they re stayed in the United States illegally, but uh, nice people. But there is quite a number of them that are criminals. Look at our prisons. Uh, you know, a good number of inmates are illegal aliens. And now, like in California, well, not just in California, but our new president, which I will never, he will never be my president, uh, put a moratorium on deportations. That means even criminal illegal aliens that were ready to be deported by ICE cannot be deported because this president rather have him here, them here, so we can support them at a time that this country is in a huge crisis. Agnes, it never made sense to me why some people in that party take that line, take the line Joe Biden has. I mean, I'm obviously not going to agree with Joe Biden on really very many of the issues, if any at all. But it would seem that having criminals removed from your own country would be kind of a universal thing for both parties, right? Why do you think it's not the case? I honestly don't know. Uh, this is not a humanitarian issue anymore. I think this is uh, probably the more illegal aliens that come in here, they're going to say, remember, the Democrats uh, allowed you to stay in and come to our country. So then later, if they ever get legalized, well, now 11 million, which that number is probably more like 20 million plus, are going to be able to vote for the Democrats. What do illegals want? They want to have their cake and eat it too. Do you think they're going to be voting conservative if that means they're not going to get their uh, uh, legalization to stay in this country? No, they're going to vote Democrat, and this country is lost forever. Agnes, I had to bring this up, but your parents, your family didn't feel like living under Soviet rule in Hungary? No, they were tired of the oppression, of the control, uh, free, uh, freedom, uh, no, not having any freedom of speech, freedom of liberty of any kind, being dominated and controlled. And we came to this country for freedom. And now our freedom is being ripped away under our noses in the United States of America. And I say that uh, on January 20th, United States has officially become the socialist United States of America. Agnes Gimney, thank you so much, ma'am. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. Anytime. We're not done yet. We'll be back. You know something else we don't talk about very much when it comes to illegal immigration is the cost. The cost is high. It's extremely high. This is from Washington Examiner. Here's a report. A record 14.45 million illegal immigrants in the U.S. costs $133.7 billion. That's not just a lot of money. That's your money, and it's my money. And to talk about that and other things, joining me now is Jessica Vaughn. She's the Director of Policy Studies for the Center for Immigration Studies. Jessica, 
I don't think people, especially people who don't live along the border, I don't think they fully understand the real cost of illegal immigration. Well, no, I think most Americans realize that there is a, a big cost, but m few people recognize the true magnitude of it. For one thing, uh, most of it, it falls on state and local governments, and they do not like to release information about the cost, how much they're paying out for welfare programs, health care, and especially school systems. And, and that's a big deal now because so many people coming illegally are bringing their kids with them as kind of a deportation shield. And uh, also, once they get here, many illegal aliens recognize that if they have a child here, sometimes that can be considered a shield against deportation. So the, the costs are huge. And, and studies have been done at the federal level by the federal government, billions of dollars a year. But that's only the federal costs. As I said, most are at the state and local level. Jessica, explain in their schools. I don't. I think a lot of people will be shocked to find out the, that illegal immigrants are educated in American public schools. Yes, uh, there was a Supreme Court ruling back in the 80s called Plyler v. Doe that decided that all children in the United States should be in school, including illegal aliens. And so when the, we you know, when we have policies that essentially make our country a sanctuary for illegal immigration and people settle here and the laws aren't enforced, um, the kids go into schools and um, it, it's costly for a couple of reasons. For one is that uh, state and local school systems set up their, um, their budgets based on how many kids they think are, are registered, say, in the spring for the fall semester. And then people show up unexpected all that time in between when the budgets are set, and they just have to accommodate them. The other thing is that with uh, respect to illegal alien kids in particular, they're usually not English speakers. So there have to be a large number of teacher aides and English as a second language instructors and special kind of social service liaisons who work for the schools. And that's all paid by taxpayers, not by the illegal aliens. Hospitals as well. This is one of those things when I used to live down in, in Tucson, used to hit me so much. And I know Southern California in particular has been ravaged by this, the hospital costs, because so often they just use the emergency room as the family doctor because the care is required to be given. That's right. The amount spent on care for uninsured individuals is massive in this country, and it can be tied to the presence of large numbers of illegal aliens. There are hospital systems that have gone bankrupt trying to manage these costs. And uh, in fact, especially under COVID, because the southern border has really not been entirely closed, there have been a lot of people coming from Mexico to get care in hospitals in El Paso and other cities along the border, which makes them look like real hotspots and is really sucking up a lot of resources for care for those people. And it, it is, and it, we're talking about a population where many of them have not had good health care all of their lives. So, you know, when they get to the United States and show up in an emergency room, that may be the first time that they have certain kinds of examinations and conditions are discovered. And once they're here, especially those getting really um, elaborate care, it's very costly to the hospitals, but they can't do anything about it. There have been hospitals around the country that have tried to make agreements with patients to send them back home, like people on dialysis and other forms of long-term care. And they get sued in court, sometimes by activist groups in in the area and literally cannot get these patients deported. Jessica, you talked about state governments hiding the costs. That, I mean, to the normal person, that sounds like something a state government would want to scream about, right? This is costing us a bunch of money. Why would, why would they hide the costs? Well, some states are doing exactly what you said. Uh, Texas, for one, successfully sued the Biden administration for the deportation freeze. And uh, one of the factors uh, that the judge recognized and acknowledged was that illegal immigration costs Texas taxpayers a very significant amount of money. But the states that are sanctuaries that want to welcome illegal residents uh, because it gives them, they, 
that gives them some political clout and gets them federal dollars and you know they they um, want to solidify their own power with uh, with these with voters who support that like California, New York, Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, Washington D.C. All of these sanctuaries they don't want to release how, information on how much it costs. They want to feed the public a line that you know we all benefit from illegal immigration and that it's making our country a better place and that they're contributing to our economy when in fact they are a net drain on our budgets. Jessica, how bad is it going to get under Joe Biden? I mean, just how radical are the people around him when it comes to illegal immigration? Well, despite all the moderate talk uh, coming from uh, the transition team and so on, what we're, we've seen so far is pretty extreme. Um, uh, the, the Biden administration has this plan for legislation in Congress that would be an amnesty for everyone here illegally and mass expansions in legal immigration programs and an end to immigration enforcement. That's gonna be a tough sell through Congress but that's what the administration has has plans to implement by executive action and this deportation freeze, which is the first step to basically abolish immigration enforcement because they can't abolish ICE. There's no support for that. So they've told ICE officers and Border Patrol and other immigration enforcement officers to stand down and not do their jobs, not enforce the law. and. And that is part of what's fueling all of these new caravans coming to the southern border because they're expecting to be allowed in by the Biden administration. And I think we can expect that the administration is going to try to try to find a way to do that without risking uh, public backlash. Jessica, forgive me, at the risk of asking a really, really stupid question, how is it legal to tell somebody not to enforce the law? That doesn't sound legal. By my reading of the Constitution, it's not legal. And this uh, first federal judge to review this in this case, uh, this lawsuit brought by Texas, seems to uh, agree that you know the executive branch has to faithfully execute the laws passed by Congress, especially in the immigration area, because our Constitution puts immigration laws as a responsibility for Congress. So I, we're gonna find out, I mean, other actions by the Obama administration were stopped by the courts and found to be unconstitutional, but it's gonna be a battle. And, and, we, and states are the ideal entities to bring these lawsuits because of the costs that we talked about and the fact that they represent American citizens and we're, we're, you know, we're going to have to see how many states get involved in this and, and how the courts react. But I, you know, there are some things that Biden is going to be able to do that are going to be unpopular. Um, and then, you know, the only recourse we have is in future elections. But for now, I think the so far the the courts are um, are, are ruling that there are limits on his power. Jessica, tell me, is, is the Republican Party changing its previously pretty weak ways when it came to illegal immigration? Did, did the Trump era kind of bring about a change for them, or are they still not very reliable on the issue? Well, there are some in the establishment wing of the Republican Party who are not particularly in favor of strict immigration rules, people like Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. Um, but I think that many of the, and many Republicans learned from the Trump experience that voters really do care about this issue and think it's important and, and support the policies that Trump implemented. And so that has emboldened them to to embrace these policies if they want to stay in their jobs. So yeah, I think it has helped and I think it has marginalized the more establishment pro-business Republicans that are in office now. Jessica Vaughn, thank you so much, ma'am. Good to talk with you. We'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. 
I know there are a thousand other issues out there right now, but the watering down of America, it's always important, always important. We always want people here who came here the right way, don't we? Is it, shouldn't that be a goal of any nation? And let me emphasize this to you as, as we get ready to wrap up here. So often, because everything gets, gets turned into race these days, so often when you bring up illegal immigration, you'll get shouted down and shamed by people. Ah, oh, you know, you're a racist. Ah, oh, you don't like Hispanics. You don't like the... Don't let people get away with that at all. Don't let people get away with that at all. You either care about, you, you care enough about America to monitor how many people come in, or you don't. And realize this. You can tell people when they start telling you that. Every single country in the history of the world monitored its immigration. Illegal and legal, by the way. You're allowed to care about legal immigration as well. Illegal and legal, you're allowed to care about it. These are issues that sane countries talk about. They talk about appropriate immigration levels. They talk about where they want to accept uh, immigration and where they don't want to accept immigration. All these things are not only acceptable, they're required if you want to have a country that lasts. And don't we all want to have a country that lasts? So don't let them shame you ever with the race talk. And don't stop caring about illegal immigration. If not only for America, for those people who live along that southern border, I've been there. I suggest you go if you ever get a chance. See the way they live their lives. See the danger they have day in and day out. And see the desperation on their faces when they say, doesn't anybody care? Isn't anyone coming to help us? I think, I think those Americans deserve our help too, don't you? All right. We'll do it again sometime. Thank you.